the English language video 30. In this video, I'll be talking about early modern English syntax, which is to say word order, which is what people often talk about when they talk about grammar, right? And as you can see in this series on early modern English, just like we did with Middle English, we've been sort of working our way up, so to speak, from sound systems, phonology to morphology, how words are built internally, and now how do you arrange words to make meaning? Um, it, early modern English syntax, I will say, is pretty close to modern English syntax. Um, let's have a look at, at some of the, uh, the features of it. Um, for one thing, um, as you know, one of the sort of plots of this whole, whole course is that English um, over the course of the Middle Ages and early modern period came to have an increasingly fixed order. You had to put words in certain order, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. As And this goes hand in hand with inflection loss, because inflections would tell you the function of a word, but when you get rid of inflections, well, how do you know whether a word's a subject or an object or possessive or, you know, whatever? You know, because where it is in the sentence, how it's put together. Another uh, feature of English is that subjects become increasingly obligatory. Um, uh, also, uh, one of the big stories about early modern English development is the um, increasing use of what are called grammatical words by Van Gelderen. Um, they are also called aux auxiliaries. And uh, in, you know, in, in an English language arts class in K-12, sometimes these are called helper verbs or helper words, right? Um, and these become a part of the language in a systematic way and become extensively used in the early modern English period though they are not yet identical to how they're used uh, at the present in, in modern English and in present day English. Um, another feature of, of early modern English is that do, the helper verb do, becomes increasingly obligatory in questions and negatives and negations. Um, also, we have a reduction in what's called multiple negation or negative concord. Um, you, if, you, if you say like, I, I don't have no problem, that's incorrect, right? You can say, don't say it. I have no problem or I don't have a problem. Um, in other languages, such as, for example, Spanish, um, uh, multiple negation, it does not cancel itself out, but intensifies the negation. This was the case in Middle English, but in early modern English, there's increasingly a shift to where multiple negation is not allowed. Um, Punctuation and capitalization begin somewhat arbitrarily, but towards the end of the early modern period become more and more syntactically motivated so that you don't just put commas wherever they feel right, but you put commas in specific places that have to do with the structure of the sentence. That's the over overview. I'm gonna look a little closer at some of these uh, features now. Um, and, and all of this can be found if you're in this class um, in Ellie Van Gelderen's History of the English Language, pages 174 to 178, I believe in chapter six, but check me on that. Um, so word order is more or less similar to modern English. Now, maybe you've read Shakespeare and thought, wait, really? Um, when you're reading literature and especially poetry, the word order is going to be more free. You're going to get antihemesis or, or inversion. Um, I, uh, and, um, and, and this is... Uh, a feature of poetic language. The, the freedom that you have with syntax in poetry is called poetic license, right? This is the, the license, literally a license to mess with grammar a little because um, early modern English poetry is, tr is, tr is mostly in traditional accentual syllabic verse forms. So in order the, the me meeting the requirements of the meter was more important than meeting the requirements of correct correct um, standard grammar. The other thing is that subjects were occasionally left out. So um, uh, like uh, King Lear says to his fool, art well, which is to say, are you are you well, right? He leaves the you out. This is an example of that. Um, so another big feature is the uh, increasing um, adoption of auxiliaries. Tense and mood auxiliaries or modal auxiliaries are introduced or expanded, but not as elaborate as modern English. So, you know, I might do it in early Middle English meant I, I am capable of doing it. To, to the word might there is actually related to the word might as in power, right? I have the ability to do it. Um, 
I would do it uh, was a would was originally the subjunctive of will, which originally meant I want. And, and so I will do it. Um, that will used to mean I want to do it, but it became grammaticalized, which is to say it stopped have being a word that had a specific kind of, uh, semantic value of its own outside of its combination with another verb. So it's during the early modern period that I will do it uh, shifts from meaning from being I want to do it to being the future tense of a do, right? Because English didn't used to have a future tense. It develops um, and becomes uh, grammatically stable in the early modern period. I don't know why the screen keeps turning off. Um, anyway, um, and Shakespeare plays with this uh, ambiguity because it's transitioning um, at the time when Prince Hal, I think Seth Lear talks about this in Inventing English, when Shakespeare, when when Henry, the uh, Prince Hal says to his father, Henry IV, um, after he's been like messing up and partying with his friends, uh, he says, um, I, I am, uh, I, I can, I will. That will is an ambiguous there as to I want to and also I will. Um, in early modern English, we don't have progressive tenses yet. I am going. No, I go. Um, we don't. I he. They are saying no. They just say they're not part of the language yet. Um, another weird feature of early modern English that has dropped out is that have and be um, ha are distinct and work with a distinct set of verbs it, uh, as auxiliary verbs to form compound cast uh, pasts. So. Um, and this distinction between verbs that take avoir, like in French, you have uh, verbs that are that use the past, that form the compound past, the passé composé, with avoir, to have, and those that form it with to be, être. Uh, and, in, and, and verbs that use have are transitive verbs, verbs that take an object. I have spoken the truth, right? Um, uh, so in, in early modern English, transitive verbs speak, see, look, take the, uh, when they're forming a compound past, I have seen, I have spoken, I have seen, I have looked, all of those take have. But intransitive verbs, especially verbs of motion, gone, walk, swim, run, traveled, take be, I am travel, I am traveled to this point, we are come, right? Um, and this distinction only finally disappears completely in the 19th century when have takes over for B in most, in pretty much all cases. Um, and the movie Oppenheimer is uh, coming out this summer. And there's that famous quote of, Op of Oppenheimer from a 19th century translation of um, the Bhagavad Gita, an Indian uh, religious text, where it says, I am become death, shatterer of worlds. And that I am become is that M is that an archaic use of B as the helper verb with the intransitive word become. Uh, the, so more on auxiliaries. New auxiliaries appear, might, should, could. Uh, there's also, we see in written text, especially in informal texts like letters and contracts, a reduction of double mo modals. So you get might have are actually written mighta or coulda or woulda in early modern documents. Um, another important feature that of the English language, a really distinctive feature of the English language that you don't see in other Germanic languages is the obligatory do in questions and negative sentences. So in early modern English, um, you, somebody might say, did I that? How like, or, or the famous poem um, by um, Thomas Wyatt, how like you this, right? How like you this, do you, which is to say, how do you like this? But in, in nowadays we have to put do or did. How do you like this? Did I that? Did I do that? And modern German and Danish, for example, still um, doesn't have the do. So like if you translate a German like, do you like your lunch? Literally, it would be like, like you your lunch, you know? Um, how like you this? How do you like this? I like it not. I do not like it, right? And so questions and negatives um, now require us to add do. This is something that became standard and obligatory during the course of the early modern English period and was pretty much stable by the end of the 17th century. What else do we have to say? Other changes to syntax. 
Negative concord or double negative disappears or becomes non-standard, I should say. It doesn't disappear. It continues to be a part of a number of regional race class dialects. Um, uh, as Shakespeare writes, I never writ nor no man ever loved. Now it should be nor man ever loved or, or no man ever loved according to correct grammar under the influence of the teaching of logicians where two negatives make a positive like in mathematics. Another line in Tempest, and yet say nothing neither, right? This is Shakespeare, but Shakespeare was not, Shakespeare didn't know the rules because they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't be invented for another 100, 150 years. Um, the other thing about er, um, early modern English syntax is the use of relatives, is that, you know, you ever get corrected, not which that, not that which, right? Those were, rules were really shaky in the early modern English period. They had not become standardized yet either. So who, which, what, that, or uh, which, a writer or speaker uses is all somewhat free compared to modern English. Um, it, we have some examples here. Shall be, here's Sarah talking. Shall I of surety bear a child which am old? We would expect who am old, right? I met a lion who glazed upon me, Julius Caesar. I wonder if that should be gazed. Anyway, let fame that all hunt after in their lives. And this is um, a restrictive clause, which we don't use that, which, or a non restrictive clause. And we don't use that for non restrictive clauses. In modern English, I'm not going to explain restrictive versus non-restrictive now. Google it. Even more changes to syntax. Preposition stranding. When a preposition is left behind after its object moves, this is common and unmarked, unremarkable, unnoticed in early modern English. Um, you know, for example, whom were you speaking to? Right. And and a and a you know strict English teacher will say, nope, don't leave your send, don't leave your preposition at the end of the sentence. This is perfectly standard and acceptable in early modern English. It's kind of just structurally um, something the language is capable of. So we have to kind of learn artificially that you don't do that. Um, we now bring the preposition with its object. To whom were you speaking? This is called pied piping, and it's become obligatory in standard, which is to say prescriptive modern English. We don't, we can't say this is the only thing I care about. We, we have to say something like this is the only thing about which I care. Now, the reason that um, I've heard that we don't end sentences with prepositions in modern English um, is because in the 18th century, uh, uh, grammarians wanted to make English more logical and and uh, you know, formal, and they wanted to be more like Latin. And in Latin, it's structurally impossible to end a sentence with a preposition. And if you can't do it in Latin, you shouldn't do it in English. This at least was the thinking in the 18th century when people were really, really, really into Roman stuff. Go look at the architecture, you know. Um, punctuation and capitalization, somewhat arbitrary. We talked about this in the spelling section, but increasingly tied to syntax. Um, that's it. That's all I have to say about syntax today. Um, and I'm going to try to figure out why my screen keeps blanking out, or my second screen, that is. Um, hope you've enjoyed. Let me know if you have any questions. Next up, we're going to talk about lexicon vocabulary. And this is the fun stuff in early modern English because they just start wilding. Bye.